So this course includes uh, four parts. Uh, the first part uh, is about definitions and main principles of machine learning. Uh, and then the three next parts uh, will focus on uh, three different families of uh, methods. The first one is um, uh, an extension of linear regression. So if you know already linear regression, uh, you, will, uh, you will learn here uh, several extensions that are useful for uh, forecasting. Uh, in the part number three of the course, I will uh, introduce a very important family of methods based on uh, uh, trees and forests, like uh, random forest, um, gradient boosting, and similar techniques. And finally, in the last uh, course, uh, in the last part of the course, I will uh, uh, make an introduction to deep learning. Uh, deep learning is an important family of uh, techniques um, very frequently used now for uh, image analysis. Uh, classification based on image, based on, uh, on text analysis, on uh, analysis of sounds. Um, and so I will finish the course by uh, this, uh, this approach. So let's start um, by the definition and the main principle. So machine learning is part of artificial intelligence. And you have two big um, uh, groups of, uh, of techniques uh, uh, in machine learning. You have uh, uh, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And in this course, I will focus on supervised learning. Uh, supervised learning is the when you want to predict one uh, response variable or several response variables as a function of a large number of inputs, while uh, unsupervised learning is when you, 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 you have a, a large number of individuals uh, characterized by a high number of different variables. You don't really want to predict anything. What you want to do is to cluster, to cluster the, the individuals into several groups. Um, so we will not focus on this second type of uh, machine learning tools today. I will focus on uh, supervised learning. Um, so um, again, um, supervised learning is about learning a function that maps uh, an input to an output based on examples of input-output pairs. So it means that um, we learn uh, to, to, to make these mappings by uh, giving to the computer uh, a series of uh, observations consisting in pairs of uh, input-output uh, observations. Um, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this approach was, uh, was described uh, in an interesting paper uh, titled Statistical Modeling the Two Cultures by Bremen in uh, 2001. Uh, in his paper, uh, Bremen um, explained, that, uh, explained that there are two modeling approaches. Approach one, uh, which try to find the true uh, model and approach two, uh, which aims at um, predicting the response y as a function of x as accurately as possible. So in, 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 in this um, uh, framework, you have a, a, a true model, uh, which is uh, unknown, completely unknown. Um, the model relates uh, one response variable name y to uh, several inputs uh, named x. The relationship between uh, y and x uh, is done using a function, mathematical function f. And the difference between uh, the observation of the response uh, y and the prediction f of x is, um, is an error named e. And of course, you don't know uh, uh, fx. Um, what you have is only a series of observations of x and y. And what you want is to, to predict y from x. And Bremen explains that there are two strategies. The first strategy is, uh, well, uh, you don't know um, fx, but you will try to find fx. So we will develop models, uh, sometimes very complex, uh, like uh, process-based models. Um, or very complex statistical models. Uh, 
and try to find the true model to predict uh, y. But Bremen says that in fact it's not a, it's not often a good strategy because um, you will never find the true model. Uh, all the models are wrong, and um, and um, it's a kind of uh, utopia to 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 think that you will be able to find the true model. And he says that we don't really care, in fact, to, to find the true model. What we care about is to predict as accurately as possible y as a function of x. And considering this, he proposed uh, an alternative uh, approach for modeling. And this is uh, this uh, second culture of modeling that we will see today. So in this second approach, in fact, there are two main steps. The first step is the training, and the second step is the testing. The training aims at um, providing the computer with the data set in order to allow the computer to learn how to predict y as a function of x. And the testing aims at assessing the performance of the train algorithm. So it aims at assessing the accuracy of the predictions. In step one, the training, uh, the data set can be um, described as follows. So the data set, the, the training data set in blue here includes two parts. The first part uh, is includes the, the observed value of all the inputs. So here you have P inputs, X1, X2, XP. Uh, they are in the columns of the part uh, name X train. And the rows consist in N values of X1, XP, X2, XP. So the column, the rows here correspond to the observed individuals. So for example, if you work on uh, on, uh, I don't know, maze fields, for example. So each row will correspond to one specific uh, maze uh, field. And the inputs x1, x2, xp will correspond to descriptors of these fields, like, for example, the uh, average temperature during the growing season, this could be x1, the precipitation sums, it could be x2. Um, etc. The soil types, the pH, um, the fertilizer rate, etc. This will um, define um, the sub match, the sub data set X train. And then the second part of the train data set is called Y train. It includes um, N observations of the response variables that you want to predict. Uh, y train can be, for example, the crop yields or the biomass, or I don't know, the um, greenhouse gas emission. Um, uh, and um, and the, the, the number of values of uh, Y train is equal to the number of rows of X train. Um, so at step one, we use this uh, data set, this training data set to uh, train an algorithm to predict uh, Y as a function of X1, X2, XP from the training data set. At the step two, we use a second data set. Um, the second data set here is in green. It has exactly the same structure. So you have um, the same columns in X test. Uh, you have uh, X1, X2, XP. It's exactly the same descriptors of the individuals. But the data are different. They come from uh, different individuals. So the individuals uh, included in the test data set are not the same as the individuals in the training data set. And the number of, of rows here is usually uh, different as well. Um, so for example, you will have, I don't know, uh, 10,000 rows in the test training data set and maybe 3,000 rows in the test data set. Here as well, you have a, a column, Y test, that includes the, uh, um, the response variable that you want to predict. But here again, the value of X test as different of, of Y test are different from the from the value of uh, Y train. 
So we proceed as follows in practice. We use a training data set to train an algorithm that will predict the response variable as a function of the, of the, of the input. So it will predict y as a function of x1, x2, xp. And then we uh, use the x test part of the test data set to run the train algorithm in order to produce predicted values of y for the individuals included in the test data set. So, this, so you, you, you obtain uh, this predicted uh, y uh, values here. And the number of predicted values here is equal to the number of rows in the test data set. Then you compare the predicted values to the observed values uh, of the response variables uh, uh, in the test data set. They, have, uh, they are of the same size. So if you have in Y test, I don't know, uh, 3000 values, you will have 3000 values of predicted uh, of predictions. And then you can compare the prediction to the observations using some kind of a metric measuring the distance between the observations and the predictions. A very popular uh, metric is the mean square error or the mean square root mean square error uh, that will uh, compute that, that corresponds to the Mean, uh, mean square difference between the observation and the predictions. Another popular metric is the R square, measuring the, the strength of the links between the prediction and the observation. And you have uh, plenty uh, other metrics that are sometimes used as well to assess the performance of the training algorithm. Um, this framework is implemented is um, what we call uh, data challenges. Data challenges are competitions aiming at developing um, the most possible accurate algorithm to make um, predictions of some quantity of interest. There is a popular platform named Kegel uh, where competitions are organized. Um, this is an example of competition. And this kind of, comp uh, it's, uh, the objective here is to predict, um, to build an algorithm that helps predicting the occurrence, peak, and severity of influenza in a given season. So you can see that uh, 50 teams participated to this challenge. And um, there was some money um, um, in the game. So um, you could um, gain as much as $125,000. Um, and, and, and this challenge, like all the challenges implemented, organized by Kaggle, are based on this framework. So you, um, for each topic, you download a training data set. Based on this data set, you can uh, develop your own algorithm for predicting uh, the, response, uh, the response variables. So here it, will, it was um, the incidence of the, the risk to, to have influenza the incidence of influenza. Then when you have uh, trained your algorithm, you download um, a second data set. In fact, it corresponds to the X test part uh, of the test data set. You don't access to the Y test part of the data set. You only access to the Y test. So you download this second part here. You run your training algorithm on all the rows of this X test data set. You produce uh, predicted values. And then you send the predicted values to the organ organizer. And the organizer will compare your predictions with the um, um, response variables included in the uh, Y test part of the test data set. Based on this, the organizer will, com will compare your prediction to the observations and will uh, compute a metric that will be used to rank all the participants. So for example, it will use the mean square error or the root mean square error to assess your, uh, your prediction, to see whether your prediction is accurate or not. The organizer will do that for all the uh, participant, participants, and uh, the participants will be ranked uh, based on that. So here you have the, the results. Here you see um, the, 
the results obtained for the uh, uh, first seven participants out of uh, 15. So in the last columns here, you can see the root mean square error. So the winner here was Alfonso Nieto Castanon. Uh, but the second one had a root mean square a bit higher, you see, but it was not a big difference. And, uh, and so on. Um, and, and here you see the first four are in the money. It means that uh, these four share this uh, $125,000. So that's the principle of the data challenge, and that's the principles of most of the um, data science projects. Uh, they are more or less always based on this kind of uh, framework. Um, so we organized uh, ourselves uh, two, two or three years ago a data challenge for forecasting uh, uh, crop yield from um, from from uh, from data. The objective was to predict um, the yields of maize and of wheat in France. And uh, if you want to play a little, you can um, you can download the, the the training data set and the test data set. So you have two trainings and two tests because you have two crops. So you have uh, one training for maize, one training for for wheat one test data set for maize and one test data set for wheat. And if you, and after the course, if you want to, to, to play a, a little bit, you can, uh, you, you can access to the data set for maize here. So you have the training here and, um, and the test here. And, and, and you can practice a little bit if you like and implement some of the techniques that you will, uh, you will uh, see in the course today. Uh, yes. Um, so in this challenge, uh, so as I said, the objective was to um, to uh, predict uh, the yield in France for maize at the scale of departments. So departments in France are small regions, um, and and the participant had access uh, to a training data set, including three. Um, 1,394 uh, rows uh, corresponding to yield data and 55 uh, inputs corresponding mostly to uh, climate variables like temperature, precipitation, uh, radiation, evapotranspiration, and so on. So this training was given to the participants. They developed their algorithms. And then they implemented, um, apply the algorithm to a test, including um, 1,708 uh, yield data. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they send us the, the predictions, and we assess their predictions, and we evaluated the accuracy of their algorithms. Here you have uh, two um, examples of results. You have two algorithms here, random forest and gradient boosting. We'll see later in the course how it works. Um, and here you have the comparison of the yield prediction on the x-axis and the uh, yield observation uh, across all French departments um, during several years. Uh, so this is for random forest here, uh, and on the right it's for gradient boosting, another algorithm. So I, as you can see, there is a relationship between the predictions and the observations. The, the, the predictions are not perfect, but uh, they explain uh, part of the yield variability at least. And here you have the metric, which was used to rank the participant. Um, so, so for random forest, you have uh, uh, an average error of 0.71 uh, ton per hectare. And uh, for gradient boosting, it was a bit uh, lower, 0.70 ton per hectare. And an important point to keep in mind when you um, implement this type of uh, framework is to avoid the risk of overfitting. Um, the, the methods uh, used uh, in machine learning are very flexible and very powerful, but uh, there is a big risk to, uh, to fit too much the data, the individual data. Um, that's the main, probably the main risk that you can have. And uh, the problem when you fit uh, too much the data, including in the training data set, is that the predictions will be very poor. 
for new data in the testing. Um, to do that, when you train your algorithm, what is recommended is to do cross-validation uh, in order to um, assess the accuracy of your algorithm even without, even before the testing itself. I will explain how it works. So now imagine that you don't have uh, two data sets, you have only one data set. I call it the full data set. Okay. It has the same structure as before, uh, X full and Y full. Uh, X full includes the inputs and Y full includes the response. And what you want to do is to train an algorithm to predict Y as a function of X, but you want to avoid overfitting. And in, in one way to do that, to check that you don't overfit the, the data, is to uh, implement a technique called cross-validation. And it, 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 works, it works as follows. So um, it's an iterative method. And the first uh, iteration consists in uh, removing the first row of the uh, full data set. So the first row is in green here. So you remove this uh, row of data and uh, you train your algorithm using the remaining rows of the full data set. So for example, here, if, if you have 10,000 rows in the full data set, you uh, remove the first one and, uh, and then you have only uh, 9,999 uh, uh, data uh, remaining uh, for training. So you train this and then you predict uh, the row that you removed. In fact, it consists in uh, allocating the first row in a very small data set, including only one row, and using the remaining part of the full data set for training. If you do that, uh, you, you get uh, an algorithm, you use it to predict the first row, and you obtain, at the end of this first iteration, one prediction. Then you, uh, at the next iteration, you remove the second row, but you keep the first one. Uh, and you use the first row and the next one, um, but not the second one, to train the algorithm. And once the algorithm is trained, you predict the second row. So here again, you obtain one prediction. And you repeat this procedure for every row in the full data set. And at the end of the procedure, after all these iterations of the cross validation, you obtain as many uh, predictions as, as rows. Okay. So you can compare the predictions to the uh, observations and compute a metric assessing the quality of your algorithm. This is the principle of the cross validation. Um, there are, there are many variants. So here, what I explain is a, is a so-called leave one out cross-validation. It is a, a cross-validation consisting in removing one row at each step. But you have uh, many other procedures. Uh, another pro popular procedure consists in splitting the data set in 10 parts. Then you remove one part, you train the algorithm on the nine remove, uh, remaining parts, and you predict the first one, and you do that iteratively. I see that there are some questions. Um, I can take them. I can make a, a short uh, break, and I can take the question. Uh, I see one question um, concerning overfitting. Is there any, any criteria to know if there is overfitting? Yes, there are several criteria. Um, one approach consists in doing what I just explained, cross-validation. So you compare um, your algorithm uh, to uh, a simpler algorithm, including, for example, uh, a smaller number of inputs. And you make the comparison between the full model and the simplified model by cross-validation. 
And then you see whether uh, the performance of the simpler model is better or not than the full model. If the performance of the simple model is better, it means that there, there is probably overfitting in the full model. This is one criteria. There are other criteria um, depending on the uh, algorithm you use. For example, if you use uh, um, a regression based model like uh, multiple linear regression, uh, when you have overfitting, you will get uh, quite often very large standard errors uh, in your estimated parameters. So if your uh, standard error uh, are very large, if your coefficients are poorly estimated, usually it's not always the case, but it's often due to overfitting. Um, I see um, another question. For the cross validation, how many data should be considering for testing each time generally? So yes, it's a good question. Um, as I said, there are many variants of cross validation. Uh, a lot of people use the leave one out, which is sometimes relevant, but it means that uh, you assume that each row is independent from all the others. That's the first issue. If all the rows are independent, you can do that. If they are not, um, you take a risk to obtain a too optimistic view of uh, the performance of your model. For example, imagine that you collected data on the same sites, on the same, uh, you have different sites, uh, like different city or different stations uh, in China, for example. And imagine that you have collected several data uh, in each one of these sites. It means that probably these data are not independent because they share the same uh, characteristic of the site, for example, the same soil type, the same climate, the same farming practices and so on. And um, in that case, uh, you cannot consider that all the data are independent. And it's not advised in that case to, to do the leave one out cross validation. It's better to do a leave a site out cross validation. So you remove all the data uh, belong, belonging to the same site. Then you predict, uh, you, you fit the model using the other sites and you predict each site in the, uh, individually. Um, another issue with the leave one out cross validation is. Uh, is, um, is uh, the computation time, because it means that you have to train the algorithm um, as many times as uh, the number of rows. So for example, if your uh, data set includes uh, 10,000 rows, it means that you have to train the algorithm uh, 10,000 times. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it, it's too long. It means sometimes uh, several days of computation. So it can be an issue, uh, but it's possible to make uh, parallel computing. So if you have uh, several computers, you can uh, perform the cross validation on, on, uh, on for some of the rows on one computer and for all the rows in another computer. Okay. Um, do you have other questions at this stage? Okay, so if not, I can continue. Uh, I can share again my screen. Yes. Uh, yes. So now uh, you have uh, already seen two very important uh, approaches uh, using a training data set and a test data set. And um, cross-validation. In fact, these two approach, training, testing, plus cross-validation, can be combined together. I can explain uh, how. Um, you will see later that many of the algorithms we use uh, in machine learning depend on at least one hyperparameter, several, so sometimes more. What is an hyperparameter? An hyperparameter is a tuning coefficient. 
it's uh, it's uh, a coefficient uh, parameter that you use to to improve the performance of the algorithm. Okay. Um, so it's very important in general to optimize the value of this hyperparameter. So we'll see example of hyperparameters later, but you have to. To, to understand conceptually what it is. It's like a tuning parameter. It's a, a coefficient that you try to optimize to, 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 to obtain better uh, performance uh, for your algorithm. Um, so if I take one uh, algorithm, what I will do in practice is to train the algorithm using different values for this hyperparameter, value one, value two, value three, value k. And then I have to choose among them. To choose, quite often, we use cross-validation. Uh, we uh, assess the algorithm with the value 1, with the value 2, and with the value k for the hyperparameter. So it means that we obtain k different algorithms. And we uh, compare these k different algorithms by cross-validation. And then? We choose the best one, we choose the optimal hyperparameter value. And uh, by, uh, from the result of the cross validation. And uh, using this hyperparameter value, we uh, train again the algorithm using the whole training data set. So we determine the hyperparameter value by cross validation, then we use it in the algorithm and we train the algorithm for this uh, specific value of the hyperparameter. Finally, we uh, test the algorithm with the optimal hyperparameter value using the test data set as before. Okay. And here in this slide, you see the most common approach used in, in machine learning. Uh, so why machine learning is uh, powerful? It's very flexible. Uh, it has a very high computational power. And um, when you have large data set available, you have high chance to obtain, obtain accurate predictions with this approach, at least a higher chance than other techniques. Um, another reason why a machine learning is powerful is that the machine learning is able to find a good balance between bias and variance. A prediction error depends on two components, bias and variance. A bias is a systematic error. A variance is, a, is a instability of the reflect the instability of the predictions. And um, and when you have a very high bias or very high variance, you, you have usually very high prediction error. So uh, the game is to, is to find a good balance between the two to obtain an algorithm with low bias and low variance. And in practice, machine learning algorithms are able to, to find this good balance. Um, to do that, uh, machine learning algorithm use several tricks. There are three popular tricks. The first one is called regularization. Regularization consists in adding information to the data set to prevent overfitting and simplify the model. It reduces the variance at the cost of a small increase of bias. The second trick is bagging. Bagging consists um, in um, fitting uh, multiple models to different uh, sub data sets uh, sampled within the whole data set. A bagging is able to reduce the variance. So the idea here is uh, instead of uh, fitting a single model to the whole data set, you sample many times many times uh, data sets in the whole data set. So you obtain many data sets that are slightly different from the, the original data set. 
Then you fit one model to each uh, resample data set and uh, you combine them together, like taking the average of all the outputs. And uh, based on that, you can show that you reduce the variance. And uh, finally, the third trick is uh, boosting. Boosting consists in, uh, instead of fitting a very large complex model, including all the inputs, you fit a sequence of uh, weak models, um, including a very small number of inputs each. And then uh, you, use, you weight them according to their uh, performance. And uh, you, you try, in fact, to fit the next model, the next simple model, to the data that were poorly predicted by the previous one. Um, and in this way, you can show that you reduce the bias. So there are a lot of methods available. Um, uh, many of them are variants of the regression models. We'll see several variants of regression in the next part of the lecture. Um, and um, and uh, so we will not see all the methods listed here today. I will show several variants of regression. And then I will show several techniques based on tree and random forest that are very powerful and very easy to implement. And finally, I will um, present um, neural network and uh, deep learning technique. It will be a brief introduction because this is a complex family of methods uh, that are very popular for uh, um, classification based on image analysis. Uh, the good news is that uh, it's uh, relatively easy to run these methods with the special packages, in particular with R or Python. Uh, today I will uh, illustrate uh, the method with R, but uh, all the techniques I show today can be implemented uh, with Python as well. Um, so um, some people uh, criticized the machine learning models because they consider that they were black boxes. Um, it was true, I think, in the past. Now it's less and less true uh, because we have now um, visualization tools uh, that are available to understand how the machine learning models work in practice. In particular, uh, it's possible, and we will do that today, to rank the uh, inputs as a function of the importance for forecasting. It's also possible to uh, produce a partial dependence plot or accumulated local effects in order to visualize the response of the outputs to each input individually, uh, even with the complex uh, machine learning tools. So I would say that it's less true than before that machine learning, that machine learning models are black boxes. To finish the first, first part of the course, uh, I will present uh, two examples. The first example uh, aims at predicting the root biomass of trees across the world forest. Uh, this was based on a data set including a little more than 10,000 uh, measurements. Uh, and uh, the measurements consisted in um, biomass of fruit and, and biomass of fruits plus uh, many characteristics of uh, trees uh, covering uh, 465 species. Um, so the main objective here was to predict the biomass of the root because in fact, measuring, of course, the biomass of fruits of trees is very difficult. It's very costly, it takes a lot of time, of energy. And so of course, if we, if, we, if we are able to predict them from the other three characteristics, uh, we can save a lot of time and a lot of money. Uh, here in this example, the inputs were related to shoot biomass, the age of the tree, the age of the tree, the species, the soil bug density, and other uh, soil characteristics. And the output was the root biomass. And here, uh, the algorithm we used was random forest. So here, the, the response was continuous. 
So here we want to, pre to, to predict the value of the root biomass. It's not a classification problem, it's a continuous prediction problem. Um, and here you have the results. In this graph here on the left, you can uh, compare the observation and the prediction of root biomass. So the prediction were derived from the random forest algorithm. Um, you can see the R square here. Uh, pretty good, huh? it works pretty well. It's a very good uh, assessment. So here it, uh, it's not based on a test data set, but on cross validation. And here you have the map uh, derived from the model. So the first map is uh, the, the root biomass map derived from the random forest predictions using uh, uh, root bio, uh, shoot biomass and, uh, and uh, the various characteristics uh, to, to make the prediction. Here you have the map of shoot biomass and here you have the ratio uh, root to shoot uh, biomass. An example two here, that's my second example, and I will finish the first part of the uh, lecture uh, here. Uh, the objective was to map the probability of yield increase for converting conventional tillage system to conservation agriculture at the global scale. Um, so here we have a data set covering most part of the world. So the, the colors correspond to different crops and the size of the circles correspond to the number of observation. And, um, and each, uh, exp it, in fact, the, the circles here indicate the locations of the experiment and each location, each, exper each experiment consisted in um, uh, two uh, treatment. Um, conventional tillage system and conservation agricultural system. Conservation agriculture is a, a system consisting in combining no tillage, so not zero tillage, uh, soil cover with the crop residues, and, um, and rotation, at least three crops. So here the objective was to see whether there is high chance or not to have a yield gain with the conservation agriculture compared to conventional tillage system. So the data set uh, included uh, four, more than 4,000 pairs of yield observation on eight crop species. And the inputs here are listed uh, in this table. So you have input related to average precipitation, average evapotranspiration, and so on. So you have the crop type as input, uh, some, some, some variables uh, characterizing the, the system. And here the response, the response is, um, is not a continuous variable, it's a yes or no uh, output. So it's a binary response. So Y is equal to one when you have a yield gain with conservation agriculture, and Y is equal to zero when you have a yield loss. And here we train a random forest model for binary classification. And uh, here you can see the, the map predicted by these algorithms after training. And the map shows the probability of yield increase for maize with conservation agriculture versus uh, the uh, tillage system. So when it's, uh, it's for maize, when it's a green, it's close to one, so it means that you have high chance of yield gain, and when it's, uh, it's uh, red, you have a, a low chance of yield gain uh, when adopting conservation agriculture. In this graphic, you have the ranking of the importance of the inputs. Um, so I will explain later how to produce this kind of graphic, but um, at least here you can see uh, whether uh, each input is important or not. So when the bar is high, it means that uh, a random choice of the value of the input um, decrease a lot the accuracy of the algorithm. So you see that here, uh, the average temperature is uh, one of the most important input variables when you choose its value at random. 
it shows that uh, you, you decrease a lot the accuracy of the classification. And the second most important input, very close to T average, temperature average, is the precipitation balance, PB, here. Um, and then you have two other variables related to temperature. Uh, on the other hand, you can see that uh, irrigation is not very much, uh, not very important. And finally, I, I, I show here um, uh, another visualization tool. Uh, you see the response of the probability of field gain as a function of the precipitation balance in the growing season. Um, this is, in fact, the average response produced by random forest for each value of precipitation balance. Uh, you can see that the probability tend to decrease as a function of precipitation balance. You have a higher chance of hill gain in case of negative precipitation balance and low chance of hill gain in case of a positive precipitation balance. This is a very popular uh, visualization tool frequently used um, to understand how the train machine learning work. Uh, so the main challenges in machine learning projects are this one. So first, it's very important to choose the relevant question. Uh, it means uh, which response variables to predict and which inputs variables to use. After you have to find reliable data, calibrate the hyperparameters, assess the prediction accuracy without bias, and optimize the computation time. And finally, uh, of course, you can visualize the output responses. So now it's time to take a few questions. Yes. So I see the first question. Uh, about uh, um, visualization tool. Yes, you have, uh, you, have, you have some very good reference about uh, visualization tool. Um, and, and in fact, it's still an active area of research. You, you have uh, this importance plot, this partial dependence plot. Um, the Chaplet values are also more and more frequently used. I will give you a few references a bit later in the chat if you like. Um, so I think there was a question from Winfeg related to one of the examples. Do you have all the input variables for different sites? If some sites did not report some specific variables, whether it's still possible to include such sites with less variables? Yes. Uh, so in our cases, uh, in, in the two examples I've just uh, shown, we, we, we didn't have any missing values, but uh, indeed in practice, it's quite frequent to have missing values. Uh, so uh, in that case, uh, there are different strategies to, um, to find, in fact, the, to estimate the missing value. So what we do, it's a pre-treatment of the data set where we try to, um, to fill in the gap and to estimate the missing uh, variables using the variables that were reported. So in that case, you add a step in the whole procedure and uh, the additional step consists in, uh, in, uh, in uh, filling, filling the missing values using the uh, variables uh, provided in the data set. In the last question, in the variable importance plot, can you drop variables with little effect? Yes, a lot of people do that. So uh, popular strategy consists in fitting the model using all the inputs. Then you rank the inputs according to their importance and you remove the least important variables. Uh, you train the model again using a reduced uh, number of inputs and you check for example, by cross-validation, uh, whether the models, uh, the simplified models, including only the most important variables, perform better than the, the, the full model. Okay, you I have, have another question. 
you can you can hear me hmm? you hear me david yes yes uh, i mean regarding the some sites that are with less variable uh for example you you explained that we can for example to to estimate the variable with some other uh, method but in some yeah. cases maybe it's not possible for example uh, the nitrogen and the phosphorus is kind of fertilizer. It's very important for the crop growth. Uh, mm -hmm. In this case, actually, we can't uh, estimate the, the fertilizer if we don't have the data. So in, in this case, can we still use this kind of science to, to be included in the machine learning method? Yeah. This is one question. So Another question, yeah. Yeah, for this first question, um, you can you can try to predict, for example, the nitrogen or phosphorus using other characteristic of your data set. For example, imagine you have a data set with a soil pH, uh, latitude, longitude, uh, uh, soil depth, uh, the type of crops, and so on. Maybe for some rows of the data set, you don't have the nitrogen fertilizer rate of the phosphorus content on something like this. But you can build a model to predict, uh, for example, phosphorus from all the other characteristics like, like longitude, latitude, uh, soil pH, uh, crop types, and so on. Maybe it will not work, but maybe it will work. And you can check it because if you have at least some uh, sites where the phosphorus content was reported, you can check whether your model is able to predict correctly or not the phosphorus content. If it is uh, able to do that, then you can uh, fill in the missing data. If it's not accurate, then indeed you will not be able to do that. And then, then you have to remove the site where the data is missing, or you have to remove the uh, missing input uh, variable. Mm, okay, I see. Thank you. So there is another question. How can you deal with temporal dependence if you are working with temporal field in random forest and boosted regression? Yes, that's a frequent issue. Uh, I agree. So there are several strategies. The first strategy consists in including time as an explanatory variables. Uh, so you create a dynamic uh, machine learning model. The second strategy consists in focusing on specific dates. So you don't try to predict the whole dynamic. You predict only some specific uh, time. And the last strategy I know consists in, in first analyzing the time series, summarizing each time series by some uh, characteristics, for example, the slope of the time series. And then instead of predicting the time series, you, you predict the characteristic of the time series. For example, you predict the time trend of the time series. So in that case, you reduce the each time series to a small number of characteristics, like for example, I don't know, uh, the time trend, uh, a plateau, if there is a plateau, uh, uh, etc. That's the three strategy I've seen in the literature. Okay. Good. So maybe we can uh, now start the second part of the talk. Uh, we share my screen again. Here we are. Yes. So now I will. So the first part of the of the of the lecture was about definition and main principles. So the second part is about um, the first family of methods uh, based on linear regression. Uh, I will show here several extensions of linear regression uh, and uh, present a few applications. Um, here you see a general description of a linear regression model. So y here is a vector including output values. X is a matrix including uh, um, rows and columns. The columns correspond to the inputs. Here you have p inputs corresponding to p uh, 
characteristic uh, like temperature, precipitation, uh, soil depth, and so on. And n correspond to the number of uh, individuals, to the number of observations. So for example, you will have uh, 10,000 rows. Uh, theta is a vector of parameters. Um, you have as many parameters as the columns in the matrix X. Um, so for example, if you have 50 inputs, you will have 50 value, values of theta. Theta correspond to the regression coefficients. And finally, you have epsilon here, uh, vectors of residuals, and you have as many residuals as uh, observations. Um, so uh, all linear regression models correspond uh, to this uh, expression. Um, linear regression model correspond to are based on this expression. Polynomial regression are based on this expression. In that case, the columns of x correspond to uh, x, uh, x square, x, x power 3, x power 4, etc. And um, linear model with interaction uh, also have this uh, expression. So this expression covers many different types of models. Uh, this is um, again the mathematical expression of a linear model, but now I show uh, what are in each of uh, its components. Uh, so you have the n observation here, uh, the matrix, including the values of the p columns for the n individuals, uh, the p regression coefficients, and the n observation of residuals. And this is a special case corresponding to the simple uh, linear regression, including only one input. Um, so you see that if you multiply the matrix uh, with a vector of theta one, theta two, you will obtain uh, y equal theta one plus theta two multiplied by x plus epsilon. So linear models are very powerful tools and uh, they are um, very widely used and very frequently used uh, in many research projects. But there are several issues and um, today, uh, I will show how to deal with each of these issues. The first issue is um, when the inputs x1, x2, xp are correlated. It's not small correlation what I am speaking about here. It's a very strong correlation, like correlation of 0 0.8 or 0 0.9. Um, the second issue is uh, when you have a nonlinear effect. So. Uh, when x1, x2, or xp have a nonlinear effect on the response y. The third issue is when you have too many inputs uh, and you want to remove some of them, the, the inputs that are the least explanatory. And uh, the, finally, the, the last issue I want to speak uh, today about is um, when you don't want to estimate the mean response but you want to want to estimate extreme response. You want to want to, when you want to make risk analysis. Let's start with the first issue. Um, so why first correlation is an issue? So in order to to explain what it is a problem, I will take an example. Oh. So I will define a true model. This is a true model. I assume that in the reality, y is related to x1 and x2 as follows. y equals 0 0.1 x1 plus 0 0.1 x2 plus epsilon. And I define uh, the residual epsilon as uh, normally distributed. So I assume that epsilon follow a Gaussian distribution with zero mean and, uh, and uh, a variance equal to, uh, to 0 0.5. Uh, from this model, I uh, sample randomly 100 values of x1 and 100 value of x2 plus 100 value of epsilon. And I consider that this uh, generated data defines my data set. And you can see the data set on the three figures here, A, B, C. Figure A show the 100 values of X1 and X2. And figure B and C 
if you look at the point first, huh? so just look at the points uh, now, we'll look at the curve later. Uh, the figure B and C show the response of the values of Y as a function of X1 and X2. What you can see here is that I, I, I generated the value of X1 and X2, assuming a strong correlation between X1 and X2, a correlation of 0.95. Okay. So X1 and X2 were randomly sampled, but assuming that they were very strongly correlated. You can see here on figure A, the strong correlation between X1 and X2. This kind of correlation is not unfrequent. You can have a strong correlation between input, uh, in particular um, when considering uh, climate variables. For example, if you consider uh, mean temperature and max temperature, quite often mean and max temperatures are highly correlated. Uh, temperature and precipitation are sometimes uh, strongly correlated as well. Or uh, evapotranspiration and radiation and temperature are also uh, often frequently correlated. And we will see now what happens when uh, you do a linear regression using two strongly correlated variables. So what I did is to fit a linear regression model using, uh, in, if you know how, I use the function LM, GLM um, to relate Y to X1 and X2. The continuous curve in black here correspond to the true response. Okay, The true response corresponds to a slope equal to 0.1 for X1 and 0.1 as well for X2. In fact, here in the reality, in my model, X1 and X2 have exactly the same effect on the response Y. The dashed curve corresponds to the estimation obtained with the function GLM of R. It's just a simple uh, linear regression. And here you can see that uh, because of the correlation, the estimation is very far from the true response. If I consider the response of Y to X1, I see that the slope of the dashed curve here is very close to zero and very different from the true slope 0.1. If I consider the graphic C, I can see that my estimation overestimate the true response. Here, the slope of the dashed curve is much higher than the true response, the true slope, which is equal to 0.1. I can see the numerical value of uh, this uh, regression. So as I said, I use this, uh, this uh, R uh, function to fit my model. So I'm in case one, uh, correlated values of X1 and X2. And uh, the graphic uh, shown here correspond to this output of the GLM function. So here I have the estimated value of the slope for X1 and here the estimated value of the slope for X2. Clearly for X1, I underestimate the effect of the variables. The true slope is 0.1 and here my estimate is 10 times lower. In addition, the p-value uh, indicates that the effect is not significant. Considering X2, uh, I'm almost two times uh, too high compared to the true value. The true value is 0.1, is here the estimated value is 0.18. But here the output explains that um, the effect is significant. Now, if I, I base my uh, analysis on these uh, results, I'm completely wrong. Here, I will conclude, based on this output, that X1 has no significant effect on Y, while X2 has a very strong and significant effect on Y, which is completely wrong because 
in the reality, x1 and x2 have exactly the same effect. Now I can repeat the same procedure, but generated 100 data, assuming that the correlation between x1 and x2 is zero. So I generate 100 data, but without any correlation between x1 and x2. And now I see that implementing exactly the same model, I obtain uh, results that are quite satisfactory because the uh, estimated effects of x1 and x2 are the same, almost the same, and very close to the true value 0.1. In addition, here, the statistical test uh, indicates that the two um, um, inputs uh, are significant. I see a question. Um, I'm not sure to understand the question. Uh, why x1 and x2 have the same coefficient? Uh, here, I, I, I define them like this. I, I, I show that if in the reality, you have two inputs having uh, the same effect on the response variables, if in your data set, the two inputs are strongly correlated, you will not necessarily uh, find that they have the same effect. So here it's a kind of exercise to show that it's, uh, it can be very dangerous to make a linear regression when uh, you have uh, strongly correlated inputs. Okay. Uh, if you, your inputs are strongly correlated, you will not always be able to uh, find the true effects of the inputs. Um, and it, as I said before, it happens frequently, quite often you have uh, highly, uh, highly correlated inputs. So for this reason, it, you have to, uh, to interpret the, the, the results of your statistical analysis with a lot of care when your inputs are strongly correlated. In order to solve this issue, uh, you can implement uh, two uh, techniques, name a principal component regression and partial least square regression. Um, the principle of the first one, uh, principal component regression, consists in uh, doing a pre-treatment of the uh, input variables. Instead of using directly the input variables in your regression, you first do a principal component analysis. And the purpose of this analysis is to replace the initial input variables uh, with new variables that uh, are built to be completely independent with zero correlation. Uh, how to do that? What we do is we uh, define these new variables as linear combinations of the original variables. And we will use these linear combinations in order to have a maximum variance to explain as much the variability of the original inputs. Uh, more formally, we proceed as follows. So here you have the original linear models with the original inputs. For example, this will be uh, uh, minimum temperature, X2 will be uh, maximum temperature, XP will be the precipitation. And then instead of fitting this regression like this, first you define new variables that I called here Z1, Z2, Z3, etc. And each Z here is a linear combination of the X. Okay. And the coefficients of the linear combinations are named beta. Okay. You estimate the beta use by doing a principal component analysis. And then what you do 
is to make a regression of y, not as a function of x1, x2, xp, but as a function of z1, z2, zk. And in fact, you don't, k, k should be lower, k should be lower than the, than the, 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 the total number of variables. How to, how to calculate this uh, values of Z? In fact, it is done auto automatically uh, by um, doing a principal component analysis. It is made, uh, you don't have to do that by yourself. It will be done by the computer directly, but you have to diagonalize the variance covariance matrix. So in my examples here, I come back to my small example here. In my examples here, the uh, principal components correspond to the linear combination of x1 and x2. So the first component is equal here to 0.7 x1 plus 0.7 x2. Um, it means that z1 is more or less, not exactly, but almost the average of x1 and x2. And the second component is the difference between x1 and x2. Um, yeah. Okay. And you will do now a regression of y as a function of x1 and x2 instead of doing a regression as a function of x1 of x2. So in practice, we replace this regression here by uh, this regression here. So here I use only the first component. So what I use is this component here. And I regress y as a function of principal component one, meaning 0.7 x1 plus 0.7 x2. And if I do that, I obtain these two regression coefficients that are very close to the true value 0.1. Yes. Less noisy here. Okay. So I repeat. So we, what we did is to replace x1 and x2 by two new variables, z1 and z2. z1 is equal to 0.7 x1 plus 0.7 x2. And z2 is equal to 0.7 x1 minus 0.7 x2. These coefficients here, uh, close to 0.7, were automatically computed by implementing in principal component analysis. And if now you calculate the correlation between Z1 and Z2, the correlation is equal to zero. It means that we replace two highly correlated input X1 and X2 by two new independent inputs, Z1 and Z2. If I do the regression of y as a function of z1, like here, um, I obtain the regression coefficients that are very close to the true value because now I don't have to deal with correlated input. Um, in order to illustrate this approach uh, with a real example, I uh, use um, a data set that you have yourself. So if you like, you can uh, download it and, uh, and run the R code uh, at the same time as the lecture. Um, so the objective of this example is to predict uh, maize biomass. So the maize biomass is noted B here, and we want to predict B as a function of six inputs describing the climatic conditions during the growing seasons under optimal water conditions. 
Um, the data set include, uh, it's not a very big data set. Huh? It includes uh, 680 biomass data obtained uh, for uh, 40 different sites in France and for uh, 17 years. And the inputs are uh, three temperature, noted uh, T1, T2, T3, and two average radiation during the same period, noted uh, red one, red two, and red three. Um, so the three temperature and three radiation uh, define six inputs, and these inputs cover uh, the different period of the growing season, the first part between one and 50 days, the second part between 51 days and 100, 100 days, and the last part. Um, so what you have to keep in mind is that I want to predict the maize biomass B as a function of six input T1, T2, T3, RAID1, RAID2, RAID3. Um, so here I have a figure showing part of the data set. Here you can see the maize biomass on the y axis as a function of the average temperature T2. Uh, you see that there is a kind of decreasing trend. Uh, and, and here you, you, you can see a more general description of the data set. Uh, this uh, figure here show um, a correlation matrix, in fact, but it is a graphical presentation of the correlation matrix. Um, each uh, circle here indicate uh, whether the correlation is positive or negative and whether the correlation is large or small. When you have a small circle and with the color close to white, it's a correlation close to zero. And when the circle is very large and dark blue, it indicates a correlation close to one. And when the correlation is, uh, is negative and close to minus one, the circle is large and uh, close to red color. You should ignore the diagonal. The diagonal is simply the correlation of each variable with itself. So of course, the correlation of each variable with itself is one, so it's not very interesting. But from this uh, figure here, you can see that some of the inputs are strongly correlated. For example, you see that T2 and T3 are highly uh, pos positively correlated. And uh, T2 and RAD2 are uh, as well uh, strongly positively correlated, and so on. Um, so here we are in a case where some of the inputs are strongly correlated. And as I've shown before, it can be dangerous to apply directly a linear regression here. Uh, if you look at the, um, the value of the biomass, the B here, uh, you can see that it is negatively correlated with the T2 and negatively correlated with T3 and positively correlated, also not very strongly, with the three uh, variables related to radiation. The negative correlation between B and T2 is consistent with this graphic showing indeed a decreasing trend. So now I will implement the uh, principal component regression to this data set. So in fact, what I will do is what I explain here. I will uh, replace the original input. And here I have six input by co linear combinations of the uh, original inputs. And then I will do the regression of y as a function of this new uh, principal component. And these two steps will be done using only one uh, R function. And this R function is named uh, PCR. And PCR can be used when you have installed the uh, package PLS. So the syntax of PCR is uh, pretty simple. So you have write PCR. Here you write the response variable that you want to predict. And here you type the name of the inputs. And here I have six inputs. You write here the name of the data set. Um, here you have a validation equal LOO. It means 
validation equal leave one out. It means that we will perform, we ask a PCR to perform a cross validation and uh, to perform a leave one out cross validation. And why we ask uh, the function to do that? Because we want to select the optimal number of principal components in the regression. And here, in fact, we now understand that this method has actually one hyperparameter. And here, the hyperparameter is the number of principal components included in the regression model. If I uh, run this function, I get this uh, output here. So um, the first rows uh, are uh, not very exciting. They just uh, summarize the characteristic of the data set. So here you have 680 rows and six inputs. And the, the response variables correspond as well to 680 rows and uh, in, the, in here you have, you have only one response to be predicted. You, uh, the number of components of principal component is six because in fact, in the principal component analysis, the maximum number of uh, principal components is equal to the number of inputs. Um, and here you have the result of the cross validation. The, no, the number indicated in this table here is, are important. Um, they correspond to the mean square error obtained with different linear regression model, including zero component, one component, two components, three components, up to six components. So uh, the, the first number, 182, correspond to a model reduced to a constant. So in this model, you have no input variables at all, the model is reduced to a constant to the intercept. So it's the, the simplest possible model. And here you have a model with one component, with two components, with three components. So the most complex model is the one including six components. Um, so here we have the mean square error. So the, the, the smallest the mean square error, the most accurate the predictions. So here we can see that uh, with one component, we don't improve the predictions compared to a constant model. With two components, we improve it a little bit, but not much. And uh, actually the best model is the one including six components here. But it's not always the case. And sometimes it's better to use a lower number of components. So here you can see the comparison of the prediction and the observation uh, with one component, two components, three components, four, five, and six. You can see that uh, indeed uh, the best one is the one based on six components. So here again, these results are based on leave one out cross validation. And um, here we are. Now I explain and a better version of the principal component regression called uh, partial least square regression, PLSR. PLSR is based exactly on the same principle as PCR. So the idea is to uh, replace the original highly correlated inputs by uh, principal components that are independent, not correlated. However, here, the principal component are selected to be highly correlated with the output to be predicted. It means that the first component will be a linear combination of the original input uh, that is uh, highly correlated with the output to be predicted. So in my example, highly correlated to the maize biomass. So the method proceeds as follows. First, it uh, identifies the linear combination of inputs that shows the highest correlation with the output, the biomass in my example. And then at the second step, uh, the algorithm determines another linear combination of the original inputs that is independent 
with zero correlation with the first one, but still highly correlated with the output. Um, in terms of implementation, uh, it is the same package, the PLS package, but now the function is not the PCR, but PLSR. Otherwise, the syntax is exactly the same. Huh? So if I, I uh, summarize the output, uh, you can see in the table here that um, maybe I can uh, you can see here that uh, already with one component you um, you have a, a small, relatively small. Uh, mean square error. It means that contrary to what we got with uh, PCR, we are able to have a mean square error uh, lower than 100 with one component. Still, the best model includes uh, six components here. So if your objective is to produce the most accurate uh, biomass predictions, you will still choose probably the model including six components. However, compared to PCR, you can see that uh, with one component, you, um, you are already more accurate than the naive model, including zero variables. Um, so here again, you have the comparison of the outputs and inputs from the P PLS model, including one component, two component, three component, et cetera. Um, Yes. Um, so this, what I explained uh, just uh, um, um, before uh, was um, how to deal with correlated inputs. Uh, as I said, um, when you do a linear regression, you may face different issues. And the second issue I want to deal now with now is uh, nonlinear effects. Um, so linear models are very powerful, but um, they assume a linear relationship between the output and the inputs. And sometimes we don't have uh, linear relationships. Actually, sometimes we don't even know what is exactly the shape of the relationship between the output and the input. Uh, when we don't know what, what is the, 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 the shape of the, the, the response, and uh, when we want to explore um, uh, whether the response is linear or nonlinear, uh, there is a very useful tool uh, named Generalized Additive Model, GAM, um, that relates the expected response, the average response of Y, not directly to X1, X2, XP, but to uh, functions of X1, X2, XP. And the functions are named S here. Okay. S of X1, S of X2, S of XP. And the S means smooth. Smooth means that we want to have a, a possibly a nonlinear relationship, but a, a smooth relationship. Uh, different types of uh, smooth function SX can be used. But uh, quite often, we uh, use a family of function corresponding to a spline. Um, a spline is a piecewise polynomial function. So uh, uh, when you use spline, Sx uh, is expressed as a function of x using a large number of cubic uh, polynomial. Um, so the principle is to divide the range of X in small um, bins. So here you have a first bin, a second bin, a third bin. And in each bin, you fit um, a cubic uh, polynomial. It means that the response will be very flexible because a cubic polynomial is already flexible. But here you don't have a single one, you have many. You have one uh, cubic uh, polynomial function for each bin. 
So here, in fact, you have many uh, hyperparameters, but they are automatic, automatically optimized by the algorithm. So the algorithm will set up uh, uh, the size of the bins and will fit uh, the cubic polynomial function in each uh, bin automatically and put together all the polynomials in order to obtain a single smooth response. And this is done, this type of function is fitted for each input. So each input has its own uh, piecewise polynomial function. So I go back to my uh, biomass example. Um, so again, uh, uh, this is the data set. So we want to predict the B, the biomass, as a function of six inputs. So here you have the site and the year, but we don't care. Here I only show the six, uh, the first six rows, but we have uh, a total of 680 rows. Um, and this is the syntax. So in order to fit the GAM model, you have to uh, install the MMGCV uh, package, and then you have to write GAM. Here you put the name of the response, and instead of writing directly uh, the, the name of the input, to write S and between bracket the name of the input. Uh, and then you obtain a different type of uh, results, but the most interesting result, I think, correspond to this uh, graphic. This graphic show the, the spline function fitted by GAM for each one of the input. So this is the, the spline function for T1, for T2, for T3, for RAD1, for RAD2, for RAD3. And this response here describe the response of the biomass to each input. So the third graphic on the top uh, left show the response of the biomass to the temperature during the first part of the growing season. The second graphic here show the response of the made biomass to the temperature during the second part of the growing season, and so on. Um, as you can see here, the y-axis cover negative and positive values. It's because uh, this is not directly the biomass, it is the biomass compared to the mean value. Uh, so it's an anomaly of biomass. It means that if you want to derive the, the biomass prediction from this model, you have to add to this different uh, function output the so intercept. And the intercept is provided here. It's 2,718. Uh, so if you want to predict the biomass for a temperature T2 of, uh, of I don't know, 10, T, T1, 10, T2, uh, I don't know, 15, T3, uh, 15. So you first take this value, 2,718, and then you add the corresponding value uh, calculated by this response function here. Okay, sometimes it will be positive, sometimes it will be negative. So if you look at the at the first graphic here, clearly you can see that the response of biomass to T1 is not linear. First it increases, and then it reaches a kind of plateau after a threshold of temperature of about 14 degrees Celsius. If you look at uh, the effect of uh, radiation during the second uh, period of the growing season, here you can see that uh, the response of biomass to RAD2 is almost linear. Here. Okay. So in fact, this kind of uh, representation is uh, very useful for exploring the shape of the response of uh, two different inputs to, to reveal a linear and nonlinear relationship between output and input. So here I've done a cross validation. This is the result of uh, the graphic B here. And you can see from uh, this cross validation that the, the root mean square error is the 96. And this 96 value 
can be compared, in fact, to the result of the cross validation obtained uh, for the PLSR model. So here, the best PLSR model was at uh, root mean square error of 65, uh, uh, which is actually better than the, the GAM model. So actually, based on these results, we will, we, will, we will not prefer using the GAM model. We will use PLSR because PLSR looks more accurate. Um, the third issue uh, I want to speak about uh, concerning uh, regression is uh, an issue um, that you face when you have too many inputs, when some of the inputs are useless, and when you want to simplify the model in order to, uh, to have a simple model showing uh, acceptable performances. And one very powerful technique to deal with this issue is the penalized regression method. Uh, in fact, this is a family of methods. You have different variants. The most popular variant is lasso. Uh, but uh, you also uh, can find uh, two other techniques that are sometimes used by people, the rich regression and elastic net. So again, we are in the framework of a linear model. And we want to estimate theta in order to uh, produce prediction. And um, to estimate theta, we will minimize this function here. Um, let's try like this. Ah, doesn't work. Um, okay. So we'll try to minimize this function here. So this function comports, include two parts. First, a part uh, measuring the distance between the observation and the prediction. It is a, a, a square error, the sum of the, the, the squared error. It's a standard uh, criterion used to uh, optimize uh, uh, the parameter of a model. And the second part, which is important here, is the penalty term. Uh, the penalty term uh, will penalize the parameter values taking large values. Uh, there are different expressions of the penalty term. Uh, the most frequently used is uh, this expression corresponding to the lasso regression. Uh, it is the sum of the absolute value of the regression coefficient. Okay, G, G here is the sum of the absolute value of the coefficient values. Uh, so for example, if your regression coefficient so one is equal to minus three, the absolute value of theta three will be three, okay? Uh, if uh, the regression uh, coefficient two is equal to uh, 2.5 uh, or 4.5, the absolute value will be 2.5 2 or 4.5. It means that the lowest possible value for J is zero. Um, it means that the penalty term will take an optimal value when all the coefficients will be equal to zero. However, if you fix all the regression coefficient to zero, the first part of this uh, um, objective function will be very high because if you fix all the regression coefficient, coefficient to zero, um, the distance between the, predict the predictions will be very poor and the distance between the observation and the prediction will be very large. So when you implement this kind of penalized techniques, you will uh, find parameter values that are relatively close to zero, but still different uh, from zero in order to uh, obtain relatively accurate predictions. 
Um, an important uh, hyperparameter here is lambda, the penalty term. If you give a high value to lambda, you will penalize a lot the large uh, coefficient values. It means that you will tend in that case, if you choose a high value of lambda, you will tend to obtain a regression model with a lot of coefficients close to zero or even equal to zero. On the other hand, if you choose a very small value of lambda, uh, then um, the coefficients will be very free to take uh, any values, even a very large values. So in practice, if you choose a lambda very close to zero, you will obtain uh, models including a lot of non-zero regression coefficients. While if you choose a large value of lambda, you will obtain a model with uh, regression coefficients, uh, with many co regression coefficients close to zero or even equal to zero. So here I give an example. It's an example uh, where the objective is to uh, predict the quantity of uh, fungus uh, spores uh, in the air as a function of uh, climatic conditions. So here you have uh, you have um, 34 inputs representing climatic conditions. And um, you have the lambda penalty term here. And uh, here you see um, the mean square error optimized by cross validation for linear regression relating uh, the quantity of uh, spores to the, 40, the 34 inputs uh, as a function of uh, different values of lambda. Here, the lambda value is expressed in a load scale. Uh, the points, the red points here, correspond to the mean square error obtained for each value of lambda. And this uh, mean square error was computed by cross validation. So each point here corresponds to one regression model. When the value of lambda is high, as here, uh, you have a strong penalization and the number of non-zero coefficient is very small. The number of non-zero coefficient is given at the top here. So in this uh, regression model here, you have only four non-zero coefficients among the 34. If you choose a, a, a small value of lambda, so uh, on the left part of the graph here, um, you inc increase the number of non-zero coefficient. Okay. Uh, you have here uh, 32 non-zero coefficient out of 34, meaning that the regression model here for this very small value of lambda include a large number of explanatory variables. So now how to choose the best value of lambda and then how to choose the best regression model. You simply have to look at the, uh, at the, at the red points and select the uh, red points corresponding to the smallest mean square error. The smallest mean square error will give you the optimal value of lambda leading to the most accurate prediction. So in this example, the most accurate value of lambda is this one, and it leads to uh, 29 non-zero coefficients. Uh, to implement this approach, you can use the package glmnet. And you have two functions that are quite important in this package. The first function, do the cross validation to optimize the value of lambda, so to optimize the penalty term here used to penalize the non zero coefficient. So this first uh, line of code here will produce this kind of graphic here. From this graphic, you will be able to choose the optimal value of lambda. Then you inject the value of lambda, the optimal value of lambda in the second line of code here to fit one single regression model. 
using this optimized value of lambda, optimized from the cross validation. Let's go back to the my maze example. Uh, I will implement um, the lasso uh, penalized regression to uh, the maze uh, example. Uh, I define a matrix including the inputs. Um, the vector including the output to be predicted, that is the biomass. And then I start just by uh, fitting uh, a penalized uh, a regression, a lasso regression. And I plot the coefficients obtained by the lasso regression for all possible value of lambda, again expressed in the log scale. So you have to keep in mind that. Uh, we, uh, in this example, I have only six inputs, three temperature and three, three radiation. radiation. Um, when I use a high value of lambda with a strong penalization, you can see that uh, the coefficients uh, tend to be uh, shrunk to zero. Each, each curve here in colors correspond to the value of one coefficient estimated by penalized regression for all possible value of lambda given in the x-axis. So when I use a small value of lambda, the, the inputs number five corresponding here to rad two, um, take this value here close to 100. But when I increase the penalization, you see, you see that little by little, the value of this regression parameter decrease and tend more and more to zero. At the end, when the penalization is high enough, the parameter value corresponding to this uh, variable uh, is equal to zero. It means that the input is eliminated, is discarded from the regression model. If I look at the um, input number two corresponding to temperature two, you can see that uh, when the penalization is very negative, uh, the parameter value uh, take uh, strongly negative values. But when I increase the penalization, the coefficients tend more and more to zero and at the end, it reached zero. It means that if I choose uh, the value of lambda corresponding to log lambda equal minus one, I will have six non-zero regression coefficients. All the variables will be selected in the regression model. But if I choose uh, four instead of minus one, I will have only one or two, uh, I will have two uh, inputs in my regression models with non-zero coefficient. Now let's proceed with the cross validation to optimize the value of lambda. Um, so I use a function CVGLM net and I uh, generate this plot here. So you can see that the shape of the red points here uh, is a, a bit different from the shape of the uh, red points here. In this example, on the spore, uh, um, the mean square error were, were very large for the big models, including a lot of non-zero parameters. Uh, the mean square error was also very large for very small models, including uh, very few uh, input variables. And, took, uh, and the mean square error took its optimal value for an intermediate value of lambda, uh, leading to a model including uh, 29 non-zero uh, coefficients out of uh, 34. However, in my biomass example, you see here, the shape of the, of the red points is a bit different. The minimum is not rich in the middle of the range of lambda, but it is rich here when the lambda value uh, took its minimum value. It means that here, the smallest mean square error corresponding to the most accurate model according to the cross validation is obtained when all the inputs, the six inputs are included in the model. So in this biomass example, the optimal solution is to keep all the inputs in the model in order to minimize the mean square error. 
And the reason here is because the number of inputs is relatively limited. I have only six inputs, three temperature, three radiations, and uh, more than 600 data. It means that I have enough data to estimate correctly all the regression parameters. And this is for these reasons that here you don't overfit the data by keeping all the inputs inside the model. Finally, I will finish this part of the course by showing how to estimate extreme responses instead of mean response. Um, this can be done using a technique named quantile regression. Um, it, this approach is useful when you want to estimate the response of y to x, not in average, but for upper or lower quantiles. Um, and it's very useful for risk analysis. The implementation is uh, easy with the package uh, Quantreg. Uh, again, I look at uh, my maze example, and now I will try to relate the biomass of maize uh, as a function of only one uh, single uh, input, the temperature uh, T2 during the second part of the growing season. So the syntax is R the function RQ. And here I, you, I show how to use it for a quadratic uh, regression. I write B tilde T2, that's the single input I T2 squared in order to include a quadratic term in my regression. Um, then I define several quantiles corresponding to 5%, 10%, the median, 90%, 95%. And here, in the small table here, I uh, show the regression coefficient obtained for the different quantiles, 5%, 10%, 50%, the median, 90%, 95%. In this graphic, I think you will understand better what happens here. Uh, I show the results of the regression corresponding to these different coefficients. Uh, this corresponds to the quadratic regression for the quantile 95%. In blue, you have the uh, regression for the quantile 90%. In uh, orange, you have the median. Uh, blue again, you have the regression for the 10% percentile. And in red again, you have the uh, regression for the 5% percentile. The interpretation can be done as follow. If you take, for example, T2 equal 20 degrees Celsius, you can, based on the results, uh, see that you have 5% chance to be higher than the biomass of here of about 3,000. You have 10% chance to be higher than this value. You have 50% chance to be higher than this value in orange and 50% chance to be lower. If I take this 10% uh, percentile, uh, I can uh, uh, conclude that if T2 is equal to 20, I have 10% chance to be lower than this value in blue here, and 5% to be lower than this value in red here. So this is very useful when you are interested not by the average response, but by extremely high or extremely low response, for example, in a risk analysis. So in conclusion of the second part, um, if you want to deal with strongly correlated inputs, you can choose either PCR or PLSR. PLSR. I recommend PLSR because um, um, you can obtain more accurate prediction with a smaller number of principal components. If you want to analyze a nonlinear relationship between uh, Y and X1, XP, you have to choose uh, GAM. If your objective is to try to simplify the model, uh, but uh, still obtaining accurate predictions, the penalized regression are, are very powerful, in particular the lasso regression. And finally, if you want to analyze the response uh, at upper or lower quantiles, 
in, uh, in, uh, in a project uh, dealing with the risk analysis, you can use the quantile regression. So I have finished the second part of my course. I can take a couple of questions if you like. And um, I see a question for the gamma regression. Is there a rule on how much flexibility to use? Um, yes, uh, you have uh, several uh, hyperparameters that can be tuned in the gamma regression. In, in particular, the number of bins, because you fit a polynomial function uh, to many bins. So you split the range of each input in several bins, and then you fit a cubic polynomial. And uh, one way to obtain more flexibility is to increase the number of bins, for example. Uh, if, you have, if you split the range of x in many, many uh, small <laughs> intervals and fit one single polynomial in each one, you will have a very high flexibility. But of course, there is a risk of overfitting, a very high risk of overfitting in that case. Um, um, so it can be a bit dangerous to do that. Um, so it's very important to evaluate. If you change this uh, default hyperparameter, I think it's uh, recommended to use a cross-validation procedure to check that you don't decrease the accuracy of the prediction. My recommendation for GAM is uh, more to use it to use it as an exploratory tool in order to see whether um, the model reveals some nonlinear uh, response. It's very useful, for example, to check whether there is a plateau, a threshold, and so on. But in practice, for prediction, it's rarely the most accurate techniques. Um, I think it's a very useful exploratory tool to detect nonlinearities, but it's not a very powerful tool for prediction. For prediction, among all the techniques I presented uh, um, in this second part of the course, based on the linear regression, the most powerful, the most accurate in practice, uh, at least based on my own experience, is uh, penalized regression. Uh, in particular, the lasso regression. That's often the winner among, among linear regression techniques. However, uh, quite often, uh, regression trees and random forests are even more accurate than lasso. And um, I will uh, show how to implement this uh, tree-based and forest-based uh, techniques just after the break. Another question on this part? So it's probably a lot of information. I hope it was relatively clear. Um, but I wanted to show you um, a range of techniques that can be useful uh, in practice uh, when you want to uh, uh, predict uh, one response variable as a function of many inputs using uh, linear regression techniques. Good. So now I will uh, present um, another family of uh, techniques, which, uh, which is very useful. It's probably, um, I would say, that the most popular machine learning technique uh, currently, tree and forest. So I start by explaining what is a tree. A tree is a model based on a series of uh, splitting rules. Simplest possible tree. Um, and um, it is based on one input, x1, and uh, it uh, calculates one output y as a function of x1. And it uh, this tree considers that uh, it, the, the output y is equal to y1. This is one value of one if <clears throat> x1 is higher than t1. And uh, it considers that y is equal to uh, y2 if um, x1 is lower than t1. Um, t1 is one threshold. And this uh, very simple model has uh, three parameters, 
T1, Y1, and Y2. Uh, and here, the output can take only two values, Y1 and Y2. It is, of course, possible to uh, build uh, more complex trees. And this is the second uh, example, slightly more uh, complex. Uh, in this second tree, um, we compute uh, the same response variable Y using two inputs, X1 and X2. When uh, X1 is lower than T1, we go here on the branch on the right. And then we have a second splitting rule based this time on X2. And when X2 is higher than T2, we consider that Y is equal to Y2. And when X2 is lower than T2, we consider that Y is equal to Y3. This second tree has more parameters. It has uh, two thresholds, T1 and T2, and three values of uh, three possible values for the output Y, Y1, Y2, Y3. And it's possible to, to build uh, many trees like this, more or less complex, based on uh, two, three, four, six, or more inputs. Um, Tree, tree, regression tree like this are very uh, popular and um, they can be trained based on a data set by optimizing a criterion, some criterion measuring either the purity of each terminal node, it's called the Gini uh, criterion, or the accuracy of the tree. And here I will consider this second possibility. Uh, consisting in uh, building a tree to minimize the mean square error. In the training process, uh, an algorithm will be used to optimize all the parameters, meaning the thresholds associated to the inputs, inputs X and the uh, output values uh, Y1, Y2, Y3. Uh, the, 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 this kind of algorithm is very powerful because uh, um, the, the algorithm will select the most explanatory variables, identify the uh, optimal threshold values, and uh, define the output values in the terminal nodes. Um, when you have many inputs, you can build very complex trees with many branches, with many nodes, and so on. Um, and here again, there is a risk of overfitting. If you build a very complex tree, you may fit very well to your training data, but you can be very inaccurate when predicting new situations. In order to avoid this, uh, or to at least to limit the risk of oversitting, the trees uh, are usually pruned, simplified, um, and uh, the level of pruning or simplification is optimized by cross validation. I, uh, for illustration, I take a toy example. Uh, this example is based on a very simple data set. It's uh, it's uh, an example used only for pedagogical reason. Um, so you have here six individuals. Each individual has two characteristics, X1 and X2. X1 is a continuous input. X2 is a binary input. And Y is the output to be predicted. Uh, to build a tree, in order to predict y as a function of x1 and x2, uh, we use the library R part. And then I will display graphically the fitted tree using the library R part plot. The syntax is uh, quite simple. You write R part, you write uh, this equation, which is a similar expression as those used in uh, linear regression. You give the name of the data set, and you can uh, set the value of some 
hyperparameter that I will explain later. And once you fitted the tree, you can display graphically the results. This is what I, I got. So the graph on the top are simply the presentation of the data. So here you have the value of y as a function of x2 and x1. As I said, x2 can take only two values, 0, 1. It's a binary input, while x1 is a continuous input and can take uh, uh, different values. Based on the graphic, you can already see here that x, x2 has a very strong effect on y. <clears throat> when x2 is equal to 1, Y take very high value, while when x2 take very small value, it is equal to zero, y take very small values. <clears throat> x1 has also an effect, but the effect is uh, relatively weaker. Um, on the bottom uh, left, you have the result of the tree, okay? Uh, you have different nodes and uh, you have splitting rules. The node on the top indicates the number of data. Uh, in, in each node, you have two numbers. The first number is the mean value of the data falling in that node. The second number, a percentage, is a percentage of the, tot of the whole data set included in the node. The first node includes all the data, and the mean value 5.5 is equal to the mean value of the, of the data set, the mean y values, okay? The value of all the y here is equal to 5.5. Then the algorithm decided that x1 was the most important input. And uh, then um, consider two situations, x2 equals zero or x2 different from zero. If x2 is equal to zero, you go to the left branch, and then you obtain 50% uh, of the data. And if you compute the mean value of this 50% of the data, you obtain 3.1. If x2 is equal to one, you go to the branch on the right, and you obtain 7.9 as mean value. Go if we go back to the left branch, we see that the second variable selected by the algorithm is x1. And the algorithm found that the optimal threshold value for x1 is 18. Then if your data has the x1 value lower than 18, you go on the left branch again, and you reach a terminal node, which corresponds to the first predicted value of the tree model. And in this terminal branch, you have 17% of the data set. And the mean value of the data falling in that terminal node is equal to 2.1. You have uh, four other situations here. Okay. For example, the, the situation uh, on, the, on the right here is obtained when x1, x2 is equal to 1 and x1 is higher than 28. In that case, uh, the predicted value is 8.9. This is a tree, the best tree found by the algorithm based on the data provided. On the last graphic here, you see the comparison between the model output and the uh, observation. So the model output are on the x-axis and the the observation on the y-axis. So you see can see the quality of fit is very good. I think that is a question. Uh, the code to display the tree, this is one question given in the chat, is R part plot model. So I, I first train the model using R part. And then I write R part plot model, model being the name of the uh, tree. Okay. Uh, 
Um, this this tool is very popular. It's very popular because uh, it's uh, it's it's very easy to understand how it works. It uh, can be used to identify the most important input. The most important input are the first selected, the least important are the, the last selected. And it's also useful to identify optimal thresholds and making categories. However, there is a big uh, limit in this approach. Uh, the limit is that uh, the tree are unstable. They are unstable, and to illustrate this, I, I, I will change slightly uh, the data set. I will change the last data. I will, I will remove it and replace it by another individual for which x2 is equal to 1. So you see, I replace these two values by these two values. And I refit the model. So I, I use this new data set with these two values and I rerun these lines of code here. And here you can see that I obtain a very different tree. In fact, the new tree does not use X2 anymore. Okay. You see, X, in the previous tree, the first selected variable was X2. And now X2 disappeared. And the tree is based only on each one. Still, the quality of it looks pretty good. Huh? But of course, the interpretation will be very different because here you will consider that X2 has no impact on Y. And this instability of the tree is very frequent. That's why it's a bit dangerous to rely fully on one single tree. And uh, for this reason, Several strategies were uh, implemented to reduce the instability and improve the accuracy of the prediction. The first strategy is bagging. In the, with bagging, what we do is to fit many trees. Instead of fitting one tree, we will fit uh, something like 500 trees. And we will, will then obtain what we call a forest. And uh, these different trees will be uh, generated uh, based on a random sampling procedure. That's why they are called random forest. Um, we process as follows. We resample K data sets from the original training data set. It's called bootstrapping. So let's imagine that you have a data set including 1,000 rows. You resample something like 500 data sets in this single data set. Each data set will be a little different from the others. Then you train one tree using each of the K data sets. In addition to that, you don't use all the inputs in each data set. So in each data set, you will sample part of the inputs and part of the rows. So each data set will differ from the others, not only uh, on the individuals, but as well on the input. So you fit one, tr one tree uh, on each data set. So you obtain K, data, K trees. So if you generated 500 data sets, you will obtain 500 trees. And you will combine all the trees together. And as predictor, you will use the average of the predictions of the 500 trees. And people have shown that this approach give usually more accurate predictions than predictions derived from one single tree. In this algorithm, you have several hyperparameters to be optimized. 
you have the value of k, the number of trees, and the number of inputs, named sometimes feathers, tested at each node of each tree. This second hyperparameter is uh, quite important. Um, it is used to reduce the number of candidate inputs tested at each uh, splitting rule. For example, if you have uh, 20 uh, inputs available in your data set, you will not use the 20 inputs, you will not consider the 20 inputs at each splitting rule for building uh, the tree. You will choose randomly a smaller number of inputs something like, for example, uh, six inputs out of the 20. Uh, graphically, uh, we can present the method like this. Um, so you uh, bootstrap a sample of data, sample one, you fit one tree, you bootstrap another sample of data, you fit another tree, and then you obtain n tree. N tree will be, for example, equal to 500. Uh, of course, you have to optimize the number of trees. This is one hyperparameter. But in practice, often 500 trees is largely enough. And if you use R, the default values for n tree is 500. Um, you have to set uh, the number of data in each terminal node in order to stop the tree building procedure. Uh, of course, if you don't stop it, you may have uh, something like uh, one data in each terminal node. Quite often, we uh, consider that we should have at least 10 data in each terminal node. And then, you can use the forest for prediction. So for example, if you use the first tree uh, for one individual, maybe it will predict C4. For the second tree, the second tree will predict C5. Maybe the, the, the last tree will predict C2 for the same individual. And then you average all the values. As I said, you have another hyperparameter in R, it's called M try. M try is the number of inputs considered in each splitting rule at each node. As I said, in practice, we don't test all the inputs at each node because uh, it will be too long and, uh, and also it will make the tree too similar. So in order to avoid this issue, we sample at random and a certain number of candidate inputs. And uh, the default value for M try is M try equals the total number of inputs divided by three. So for example, if you have, um, I don't know, 33 uh, inputs, M try will be set equal to 11. But quite often, the default value is not the optimal value. So it is recommended to test different values of M try and check whether which one is the best one by cross validation. So here are some uh, useful package to run uh, trees and forest. So air part is very useful to fit uh, trees. Uh, random forest is a useful package uh, for uh, fitting random forest. It is actually the historical package of R. Uh, but uh, random forest is a bit slow. And if you have a big data set, uh, I recommend using another package named Ranger, which is a fast implementation of random forest. So Ranger is uh, presented in this paper that can be downloaded just by clicking here. And in this paper, the author uh, show, uh, compares the computation time of the two package. So here you have the number uh, of trees in the in graphic A, you have the number of trees uh, on the X axis and the runtime in second on the Y axis. Each curve corresponds to one package. 
Um, the random forest package is the curve in uh, green here. So you see the runtime in second increase very quickly as a function of the number of trees. Whereas if you use ranger here, you see that the runtime in second increase as well as the number of trees, but uh, the, the increase is much lower. And here you have a second comparison of different package for fitting random forest uh, algorithm. And, um, and instead of putting the number of trees in the X axis, it's the number of fissure. And as I said, fissure, it's a synonym of inputs. So it's the number of explanatory variables used in the forest. So here again, you see that uh, uh, the package random forest in green increase the running time increase very quickly, but uh, for ranger it's uh, very slow. So, but however, if you if you have small data sets and small uh, forest, there will not be big differences between the package random forest and ranger. It's only if you have to deal with uh, with a big data set, including thousands and thousands of. Uh, of rows and many, many inputs. Um, so now I will uh, fit a tree to my maize biomass example. Uh, this is a syntax. Uh, here I, I uh, uh, upload the library and here I call R part. So you see the syntax is very simple. Huh? And uh, then I plot the tree. And this is the tree I, I got. Um, so here, um, so you see we have a relatively large number of terminal nodes corresponding to different uh, predicted values. And these predicted values correspond to combination of temperature and radiation variables. The first variable selected is T2. It is the most important according to the algorithm. It is actually the variable uh, showing the highest correlation with biomass. So it's logical to, to, to have it uh, at the top of the tree. And then you have uh, radiation selected, rad1, rad2, and then t2, t3. Um, the only variable not selected here is rad3, which look uh, quite uh, um, unimportant for predicting maize biomass. It is the radiation at the end of the season. It is indeed less important because the photosynthesis is almost finished at the end of the season for the maize plant. Now let's fit a forest. So before it was a single tree, now I will fit a forest. So the syntax for uh, with the library random forest is also pretty simple. You write random forest, the equation, the same as before the name of the data set, you set the number of tree and uh, m try, which is the number of uh, uh, inputs tested at, at each uh, splitting rule. Um, here I, I set m try at six, meaning that I, I ask uh, the package to test all variables at each splitting rule. It's not necessarily optimal. It was uh, my first attempt. So it seems to explain a big part of the variability, uh, 96%. But uh, in a forest, I'm not able to visualize in fact the forest because I have 500 trees and it's post not possible to describe the 500 trees. So what we do is to uh, visualize in fact the, the, the behavior of the forest using different visualization tools. Um, so first, it is useful to look at the mean square error as a function of the number of trees in the forest. Here you see the mean square error, the y-axis as a number of, uh, of as a function of the number of trees on the x-axis. So you see that the mean square error decreases a lot at the beginning when you when we increase the number of trees, but after 200 or 250 trees, it does not decrease much anymore. It means that 500 trees largely enough. Actually, we could even reduce the number a little bit. 
In this graphic generated by this function var important plot, uh, you can uh, visualize the importance of the inputs. Um, the value on the x-axis correspond to a decrease of accuracy of the forest when uh, the uh, inputs given on the y-axis are um, when the values of the inputs are selected at random. So if I choose randomly the value of T2, I decrease a lot the accuracy of the forest, revealing that this variable is very important. And the second most important variable according to the forest is RAT2, and the least important variable is RAT3. So it's possible as well to make a cross-validation. I don't have time to present that uh, here. What I want to show is the comparison of the prediction and the observation here with cross-validation B and without cross-validation A. So there is a big difference here. Yeah. And um, I will show you how to do it by yourself. So here you see my uh, RStudio code. Um, you have it, you have this code uh, on, the, on the, you have it, you should have downloaded it. Uh, so you can install it on your own uh, computer. And the first thing to do is to set the working directory. So you have to choose the directory where the file is, uh, is uh, present. So here, this is a repository on my own computer, but you, you of course, uh, will have a different name depending on the chosen repository to, to save the file. So you can see here, the, the name of the, of the file here, where the data are. And then uh, I can uh, uh, read the data set. So if I type now the data set, clearly I was able to read it. I have the data set here, the biomass here, the input. So the first part of the code corresponds to the previous uh, uh, lecture with the partial uh, uh, principal component regression, uh, PLS, uh, GAM here, cross validation to check uh, the accuracy of GAM, um, then uh, the library to uh, implement the lasso regression here then the cross validation for the lasso regression, the quantile regression. So this is the code for, for uh, uh, implementing the, 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 the methods based on linear regression. And now we have the part dealing with, um, with the tree. So here I will uh, read the package and then I can uh, uh, train a tree. You see it's very fast. I can print the tree on the, on, the, on, the, on the console. You see the tree here. Uh, this is uh, uh, all the characteristics of the tree with, uh, with the threshold and the terminal node and so on. But it's, of course, not at all convenient to display the tree like this. It's much convenient to, uh, to print, to plot the trees. And here you have the tree on the screen. And the next part of the code uh, implement random forest. So here I run the library, I fit, I train random forest. So you see here it's very fast because the data set is very small. If I write plot, uh, here, I will get this graphic showing the evolution of the error as a function of the number of trees. Here, I will plot the importance. So you see that the most important variables are T2, RAT2, and the least important are RAT3. This is uh, the cross-validation. I have no time to show it. 
And I uh, think that's it for now. Yes, I can uh, I can plot the prediction and observation. Yes. So this is it for this uh, third part of the course about tree and random forest. I don't know if you have any question on this part. Actually, I have one question regarding the, for example, trains or run a forest. It's really related to the observation. I mean, for example, if, if I want to do some um, training with the train, trains and the forest, how many data, I mean, the minimal data I need to, mm -hmm. to use to consider in my research or in the training. Um, there is no official minimum data, but um, clearly this kind of approach is not useful if you have less than uh, several hundreds data. So you need to have uh, several hundreds uh, rows to obtain interesting results with this kind of approach. Otherwise, the trees will be very unstable and the forest will not be accurate. If you do a cross validation with small data set, you will not obtain accurate results, usually with less than a few hundreds data. So now, if you look at the applications of random forest published in the literature, you rarely see application based on less than 500 data. Okay, thank you. Some people do with less like 200 or 300 data, but uh, it's not frequent. Now, there is a question on the chat uh, concerning um, the threshold. Uh, yes, I agree with you, uh, Jonathan. Um, um, single tree um, is a very attractive tool to, to compute thresholds, as you say in the chat. Uh, it's very uh, interesting for biologists and ecologists for interpretation. And as I said, they are unstable, so it's a bit dangerous to rely fully on them. So um, what, um, what people uh, do with forest, because in, in the forest, you don't have um, an explicit threshold, but it's possible to visualize um, the mean response of a forest. Um, as a function of the input value, I can show that. Um, yes, I will share my screen. So here you have what is called a partial dependence plot. So uh, it's another example. It's an example um, based on a big data set here. Um, and the objective was to predict the probability of yield gain as a function of many inputs. So the inputs are here. And here you have the, the partial dependence plot. So on the y-axis, you have the, the output of the random forest, which is the probability here. And on the x-axis, you have one of the inputs. And each curve here corresponds to the mean response predicted by random forest for different type of cropping system. So here you have a three type of cropping system. And, and based on this, you can identify graphically some kind of threshold. For example, here clearly there is, there is a threshold of precipitation balance around zero. The probability is much lower when the precipitation balance is positive than negative. Um, so it's less convenient than a tree, but, but, but still, it allows you to identify uh, nonlinear re response uh, and thresholds. Chaplet uh, values uh, are another tool. Um, it's not totally equivalent, but um, um, it, 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 it is used to make a decomposition 
of uh, a difference between a prediction and a mean value. So for example, uh, if you predict uh, one individual and if the prediction is uh, very high, much higher than the mean value, you uh, may want to know uh, what is the reason explaining um, why the prediction is so, uh, so high. So in that case, you can use Shapley value to decompose the difference between the prediction and the mean value into different components. And you will be able in this way to identify which input was responsible for, uh, for the big difference between the prediction and the mean, and the mean value. So Shapley values are very useful for as a diagnosis tool for explaining uh, big anomalies in the big high values or very low values compared to the mean, mean observations. Um, if you are uh, still alive, we can uh, quickly uh, shift to the part number four of the course, if you have time. Huh? It's not too late for you, one thing? Yeah, no, no problem. It's, uh, it's okay for me. Good. Um, uh, the last part. Is about deep learning. Um, okay. So, what is deep learning? It's often considered as a special type of machine learning, and it's adapted to very large data sets and unstructured input data. What is unstructured input data? It's data that are not organized in um, rows and columns, where the rows correspond to individuals and the columns correspond to uh, inputs. Uh, there are many examples of unstructured input data, in, in particular images, text, sounds, etc. Um, it is uh, based on neural network. And uh, the inputs are replaced by a large number of pleasures summarizing the characteristic of the original input. And these feathers are automatically generated by the algorithm. So somehow it's a bit like uh, principal component uh, regression or PLS. You remember that uh, principal in principal component regression on or PLS, we replace the original input by linear combination of the inputs. And here we will do something more or less similar, also more sophisticated. We will um, replace the original inputs by uh, new inputs that uh, will show different aspects of the images, of the text, etc. Um, in order to, I don't have a lot of time now, so I will use an example to explain the main principles of deep learning. And the application is about the recognition of numbers. Uh, in my data set, I have 60,000 images of numbers available for training. And I kept 10,000 additional images for testing. So I will train my algorithm using 60,000 images, and I will test my trained algorithm using 10,000 images. So here you see that in deep learning, we don't deal with data set, including only a few hundred of data. We deal with data set including thousands and thousands of data. So don't try to implement this kind of algorithm if you have uh, 500 data or uh, 1000 data, you need several thousands data. 
Um, so this is the, the, the piece of R codes uh, used to define the training and testing data set. Um, so here we have uh, X train corresponding to images. And we have Y train corresponding to the labels of the image, images. So the labels will, will indicate the, um, whether the numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And we have the same structure for the testing data set. We have X test, including um, the images of numbers used for testing and Y test, including the labels of the image. I give an example of image. This is an image of a two. So it is an image of a two written by N, but it was uh, uh, numerized after that. And the label of this image is two. Okay. So your eyes see that it is a number two. But here, what we want to do is to make the computer learning that this kind of image corresponds to a number two. And the same for images representing three, four, five, etc. So here, the image corresponds to a raster of 28 by 28 pixels. And each pixel include a, a color between white and black. So it's a, a, a gradient of gray color. And the gradient of gray color is a number between 0 and 255. When it's 0, it's black. When it's 255, it's white. And when it's between 0 and 255, it's some kind of gray. OK? So what is important to understand here is that uh, in X train, you have images corresponding to uh, 25, 28 by 28 um, uh, clusters. Each pixel include a number between 0 and 20 and 255, uh, indicating a level of gray. And a white train corresponds to a label, indicating whether the number is 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9. So this is another example. Um, so here, um, it is a 4, you see. Um, and here again, we have a raster 28 by 28. Um, so we have many, many images like this. They are all different. Huh? Uh, uh, the number four will not be always written like this. Uh, and the number two as well, they will be written differently. Different people will write these numbers. And we have to build an algorithm in order to make the computer um, correctly identifying whether the image represents 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 9. So let's have a look at, uh, at um, this uh, one example of raster. So this is an image, but now I don't show the image graphically. I printed the image on my console. So you can see what is inside in terms of number. So here I don't show the whole image because I did not have enough space. You see only the first 17 rows and the first 17 columns. But in total, you have 28 by 28. Huh? So you see many zeros. And the zeros correspond to the black color of the image. But of course, sometimes you have no zero number indicating light gray. 18, for example, will be something like light gray or black when you are at, uh, or white, sorry. <clears throat> white, uh, 253 will be almost totally white. What we do now is to transform this raster format into a standard format that we know how to manipulate in machine learning. 
That is, we want to transform this raster into a table where the images will correspond to different rows. It means that I should have 60,000 rows in my table and where the columns will correspond to the number indicating the level of gray in each pixel. It means that I, I want to obtain a table including 60,000 rows corresponding to 60,000 images and 28 by 28 columns, that is 784 columns. This is what I do with this, uh, with this function here. I reshape the original format, the raster format into a table, including uh, as many rows as images and as many columns as pixels. Finally, I uh, standardize the number between zero and one instead of zero and 255 just by dividing uh, the uh, tables by 255. At the end of the process, I obtain uh, two tables for the training data set, the table X, including 60,000 uh, rows and 784 columns. I just show here an example. This is the six, the first, six images and then the, the columns here. Um, everything was normalized between zero and one. When it's one, it's white. When it's zero, it's black. So here we have the, the pixel 129, the pixel 130 and so on. So three, Keep in mind that we don't have only six rows, but 60,000 rows. And here you have the format of the white train table. I have 10 columns. All the columns are binary and they report the labels. When it's one, it indicates that the number corresponds to the corresponding column. For example, so the, the first column corresponds to the label zero, the second to the label one, the third column corresponds to the label two, and the last column corresponds to the label nine. It means that the first row corresponding to the first image is a number corresponding to five. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. And the second image corresponds to a zero here. Yeah and the image number five correspond to a nine, okay? So the uh, computer should learn to uh, uh, predict the Y train uh, matrix from the X train matrix. That's what we want to do. To learn to predict the correct image label, from the image characteristics. This is a summary of what we get at this stage. So far, we only uh, perform a data transformation. And now we will uh, learn how to predict Y train from X train. And to make this prediction, we will use a special type of model named neural network. And we will use multi-layer neural network, which is known to be very powerful to analyze this type of data. If you follow, you now understand that the number of input is equal to 784. This 784 corresponds to the columns of this matrix here, corresponding to these columns here, including numbers between zero and one, indicating levels of gray. And the output corresponds to 10 columns, binary, indicating whether the number is zero, one, two, three, up to nine. So we have to 
build a model using these 784 inputs, predicting these 15 these 10 categories. And between the inputs and the outputs, we will use three layers of uh, neural network. Let's have a look at what is inside each layer. In the first layer, we have 256 small mathematical functions. These functions are called neural. And um, they are relatively simple mathematically, but they include a lot of input. Is each one of these 256 functions include all the inputs. The X here correspond to the columns of this matrix. They correspond to the zero one inputs here. Okay, this is the value of X here. And we use a linear combination of these inputs as an input of a function F. The function f itself will be pretty simple. I will show it a, a bit later. But what is important is that we have 256 functions like this one. It means that this layer includes a very large number of parameters because each one of these functions include one intercept and a lot of regression coefficients. In fact, it includes 784 regression coefficients because we have 784 inputs. It means that each one of these functions include already 785 parameters. Um, the second layer looks like a lot to the first one, but it is a bit smaller. It includes only 100. 28 function, and the input of the second layers are the output of the first layer. It means that the, the inputs, the number of inputs of the second layers is equal to 256. Okay, as we have 256 uh, small functions here, each one predict one output, we uh, have here 256 inputs. And the third layer include only 10, 10 small functions. And each, 10, each one of these 10 functions use the outputs of the second layer as inputs. It means that we have here uh, 128 inputs for the third layer. Each one of these uh, 10 functions will calculate the probability that the image is a zero, a one, a two, a three, a nine. Okay. So now you may wonder how we decided to include 10 uh, functions here, 128 here, 256 here. It was decided based on previous work. It was optimized by uh, using very powerful computers with, who tested uh, a lot of different combinations and found that these comp combinations work pretty well. I don't recommend you to make many comparisons yourself because it will take a lot of computation time. I recommend instead using a structure that we have published in previous work like I did here. So just now look at the function f itself. As I said, for the first two layers here and here, the function f is very simple. This is the function f. It is equal to zero when the linear combination inside the function is negative. And then it's linear when the linear combination inside the function is positive. The last uh, function, this, uh, the, the function used in the last layer here is different. It is uh, chosen in order to produce an output between zero and one because we want 
the layer, the last layer to calculate the probability to have a zero, a one, a two, a three, a nine, etc. So we use a function called softmax, which, um, uh, which has just this shape and uh, whose range is zero and one. This is, uh, so to implement this kind of model, you can use the Keras package of R. You have a similar package in Python. And here you see the definition of the first layer, of the second layer, yeah, and of the third layer. This is a summary of the model characteristic. You see the number of parameters here, it's huge. Huh? The total number of parameters is more than 335,000. So of course here, the risk of overfitting is huge. Huh? You have much more parameters and observations. So in fact, there are different tricks in the optimization in order to limit the risk of overfitting. I have no time to explain, but um, um, in the optimization algorithm, everything is done to limit as much as possible the risk of overfitting using in particular cross-validation. Um, to fit this kind of algorithm, to train it, uh, you have um, some uh, function available. So, and it's an iterative function. You have to make several, uh, several uh, run of the model. And here you see the evolution of the loss function measuring the distance between the observation and, and the prediction. And at the bottom, you have the accuracy, which is the proportion of image correctly predicted. Um, and you see that after a few iterations, the algorithm is able to, to correctly classify uh, almost 99% of the images. Uh, after training, you can um, <clears throat> apply uh, the model to the test data set to check that you are able to correctly um, classify the images of the test data set. So it is done here and you see that uh, we have an accuracy of 80, 98%. And then you can uh, give a new image to your algorithm and ask the algorithm to identify the correct label. This is what I did here. I use a train algorithm uh, to uh, predict, to compute the label, to classify this image. So you see that it is a five. Also, the five is not very well written. Uh, so you, you see it yourself. Uh, and if you ask now the computer to uh, classify this image based on the train algorithm, you see that indeed it correctly identifies it as a, a, a five, a number five. Um, this is uh, a demonstration of a multilayer neural network. And there are uh, some uh, more sophisticated variants, including convolution. Uh, convolution, what is it? It's a filter. So instead of working directly on the images themselves, you will uh, um, use a, a filter to uh, obtain uh, new images showing specific aspects of the object. Um, and uh, this can be very powerful as soon as uh, your objects are quite complex. For the numbers examples here, it's not really useful to use a filter. You can directly use the, the, the picture of the, of the numbers directly as I did. It works pretty well, huh, as you could see before. Uh, but for more sophisticated image classification problems, it's often useful to use this convolution and to work on um, new, uh, uh, new um, um, feathers uh, derived from the original pictures. So a convolution is a filter. A filter is a matrix, including uh, 
uh, some cells like here. In each cell, you have a number called a weight. And then you will pass the filter on the image and uh, calculate the average mean of all the cells included in the filter. So you will obtain a number here. And you do that uh, iteratively. You pass the filter on the image. You obtain another number here, and so on. And when you have finished, you obtain a new image, smaller than the original image, focusing on some aspect of the image. And this is this new image, this feather, feather map, it's called feather map, that will be used uh, as inputs in the multi-layer neural network. And in some cases, it improves the accuracy of the classification of the image. So this, uh, this kind of approach is more and more frequently used for image classification. Uh, so I just show an example for numbers, but you can implement it for recognizing plants, for example, animals. It's uh, widely used uh, for uh, text, uh, text mining. Uh, in medical science, it can be used for uh, disease diagnosis. It can be used for weather forecast, for automatic translation of text. This is an example here um, where um, the author here use uh, deep learning to uh, classify um, um, human uh, uh, embryos in order to determine whether they are uh, um, of high quality or of low quality for in vitro uh, uh, insemination. Uh, so the idea is to proceed uh, in uh, in vitro fertilization, and then you have embryos, and then you have to determine whether uh, they should be inseminated or not, and what is the chance of success of the insemination. So instead of choosing them at random, uh, you can uh, train an algorithm that will calculate the probability uh, to have a high quality and poor quality embryos, and then you will choose the embryos should, uh, having the highest level of quality. So for example, here you have uh, four pictures. The first one is of uh, a very high chance to be of poor quality. Uh, this one is uh, a very high chance to have uh, good quality in B. And C, it's uh, uh, almost sure that it is uh, a very bad quality. And uh, D, it's almost sure that it is good quality. So in fact, in that case, you will discard A and B and choose I, A and C, sorry, and you will choose uh, either B or D. So that's the end of the lecture. Um, so in conclusion, um, if you want to uh, involve yourself in a machine learning project, uh, you have to deal with uh, several challenges that is important to keep in mind. So first, of course, you have to choose the relevant question, meaning that you have to define carefully uh, the response variable y to predict and the inputs x. You have to find reliable data. Uh, you will have always to calibrate some hyperparameters. We have seen several examples in the, in the lecture. Uh, it's very important to um, be aware of the risk of overfitting. So that's why it's important to assess the prediction accuracy using, if possible, an independent test data set to cross validation. In some cases, if the data set is relatively small, the computation time will not be an issue, but uh, with very large data set, you will have to optimize the computation time. And of course, the uh, interpretation of the result is important. Uh, well, the main objective is to minimize prediction error, but it's also uh, to, to learn something about the, the process, uh, to learn something about the system under study. And for this, uh, visualization of the output responses uh, is uh, very um, relevant, usually. Um, if you want to do uh, something, uh, if you want to involve yourself in machine learning, I usually recommend starting with two simple methods that we have seen today. 
uh, penalized linear regression, in particular LASSO, which is uh, quite powerful in practice. It is based on linear regression, but will allow you to simplify the model in order to make it more efficient. And random forest, which is very powerful as well, it will allow you to take into account uh, nonlinear responses and interactions. Uh, and in practice, it's often, uh, it's often a winner. Uh, some trends, um, visualization tools, a lot of people work on the development of such tools uh, to open the black boxes of machine learnings. We see more and more application of image and text analysis. Uh, we see also more and more new packages uh, to streamline the development of predictive models. So all the different steps I've shown here, like uh, training, cross-validation, testing, can be easily now automatized using dedicated packages like uh, Caret, H2O, and so on. And now we start seeing a new trend co consisting in including expert knowledge in machine learning. So it's uh, not only about data anymore, it's about data plus expert knowledge. Uh, another interesting um, uh, type of application of machine learning is the emulation of complex models. A lot of colleagues develop very sophisticated models, process based, uh, that include a lot of uh, inputs and uh, have long computation times. And now we see more and more application of machine learning to replace these complex process based models by a simpler. Um, machine learning based models like random forest or lasso regression um, with smaller computation time and lower number of inputs. So here the idea is to find a random forest, for example, able to produce almost the same uh, simulations as a complex process based model. And that's it for me. Um, so okay. I finished my lecture. I can still uh, take a couple of questions if you like. Thank you for staying with me. But uh, then the question is that, uh, do you think which time we think we should use the, the physical model or the process-based model? And, and which time you think that uh, we need this kind of machine learning? Because it seems that we can use the machine learning method to replace the Mm, physical model, do you think so? Or you think that we still need this process model? Uh, yes, I think it's a very good question. Um, when I started, uh, when I was uh, young, in my institute at least, everybody was believing that uh, the best tool was process-based model. Uh, I think this idea was shared by many scientists across the world. It was not only in my institute. So the key, so most of the research was oriented toward the development of process-based models. And I think it's not the case anymore because uh, there are several reasons. The first reason is that now people are aware that these process-based models are often totally inaccurate. They don't, uh, are, they are not able to predict accurately uh, a lot of outputs. And uh, a second reason is that they are very complex. So when you want to make uh, practical applications, it's not easy to use them to make the applications. And very few people are uh, qualified to do that because very few people understand exactly how the process based model works. And so now people are, a lot of people are shifting. They are shifting because uh, for these two reasons. And also because data are more and more available. And instead of spending uh, a lot of time and a lot of money for developing a process-based model, it's more efficient, uh, more and more often more efficient to directly use the data set and to train some machine learning tool and to use it for the practical application. So I think that the, the trend is changing now and that for many applications, it's more efficient to use a data-driven approach than developing process-based models. 
However, it's not the case probably for all um, areas of science. Maybe in some area of science, there are still not enough data available to implement machine learning tools easily. Uh, but as I would say that as soon as you have enough data, as soon as you have uh, a few thousands data available, uh, I, I would recommend starting with machine learning tools, yes. And as I said at the end of my last talk, a new train is to emulate the process-based models because um, they are costly to use even when you have finished to develop them. It's a bit difficult to use the process-based model to make uh, large-scale applications, for example. And also they require a lot of inputs that are not always available. And uh, for these reasons, I have some projects uh, in which uh, the objective is to run uh, a process-based model a few thousand times and then train several machine uh, learning algorithms on this few thousand simulated data in order to develop an algorithm that will be then used uh, in replacement of the process-based model. Um, I've seen a question consisting how to generate the partial dependence plot. Uh, you have um, in the random forest package, I put it in the chat, you have one function of the package, partial plot, uh, which produce directly the partial dependence plot. And uh, otherwise, if you want to make more sophisticated uh, uh, partial dependence plot, you can use uh, the PDP package. The partial plot is already uh, interesting, I think. Okay, so thank you for staying with me until the end.